Greetings to the household, to the saints of God, to all of those that God is preparing to be the radiance of His glory as the corporate sun, the carriers of the presence of God in the earth. Today we'll continue with what is really still an introduction as we look at the seven spirits of God or the seven characteristics of the Spirit of God, or the sevenfold Spirit of God, God being Spirit, understanding these characteristics of who God is. And as it pertains to us who are born of His Spirit. Months ago we started looking at the appointment that God has made concerning us to be his magistrates. We saw that we were in the mind of God, in Christ, before creation, in the Elohim as the magistrates. And we were talking of ruling and judging. What is the purpose of us ruling? Why are we to rule in the earth? Well, it's obviously to put God on display. It is an extension of the rule of God as we are kings of the king, who is king of kings. We are an extension of his rule. The ones who stand in the place of God as if he were standing there himself ruling the viceroy that rules in God's stead. It is to put the character of the king, the character of God, of his nature, accurately on display through rulership, righteous rule. So that's why we are called as his magistrates, to rule, to judge in the earth. Not as a self-righteous proclamation and trying to put others down in being judgmental. No, it is an exercise of the nature and character of God being put on display through us by His Spirit. Which means we are to live by the Spirit. And so that's how we are to rule. The why is to put God on display. The how is by the Spirit. God, through these seven characteristics of the Spirit of God, forms in us His nature and character as we are assembled into the Spirit of Christ. God now forms in us His nature and His character and the understanding of the seven Spirits of God is not an academic attempt to try and say we have some more knowledge, we have a better theology than other people and we can tell them things that they didn't know. It's not about an academic approach or just having head knowledge. It is in fact because we realize our mandate, our daily activity on the earth, is to put God on display. And so all of God's training us, bringing us to maturity, all of us going through trials and difficulties and learning how the Spirit is to rule over the soul, all of this is to put God on display. And the central focus of all of The seven spirits of God is really the spirit of lordship. We'll look at that even as we look at the picture later on. That the center focus of what is the spirit of God is he is lord. The understanding of lordship which is about ruling, righteous rule. And out of that flows actually all the other attributes and the characteristics of the Spirit of God. Joined to rule, 
We will see as we discuss it somewhat today and more at length later on is love. God is love. And it is only through love that His rule is displayed. And His rule, His majesty, the kingdom of God and the rule of the Lord is only put on display by love. And the two are connected in that God is love and the essence of the Spirit of God is seen through His Lordship and how it is put on display. Now, for God to reign and rule through a people, He has to prepare a people to be capable to carry His presence. God being Spirit, He is preparing us to live by the Spirit. And He's equipping our spirit man, so to speak, to be able to be effective and accurately display who He is by carrying His presence by the Spirit. And God is also preparing a people who can receive the revelation that comes from heaven. The revelation of who God is. The revelation of all that God has placed in heaven to come into earth. God is preparing a people to receive that revelation and then to be able to walk in the responsibility associated with that revelation. To whom much is given, much is required. And as God is revealing more and more of His purpose, of His intent and of His nature to us, much more is required in terms of how we now walk out that rule, that lordship, putting God on display as carriers of His presence. Part of this preparation of preparing a people is obviously also to dismantle the notion that is presently prevalent in the earth, that the institution is actually the picture of who God is. The standard that presents truth in the earth, in many people's minds, the standard that is presently presented in the earth of the truth of who God is, is assumed to be the institution. That is the standard. That is who God is. That is what God looks like. And God is dismantling that notion. He's undoing that. He's judging it. He's exposing it for the truth that God will only be revealed through His Son. He will not be revealed through an institution. God is spirit and He only makes Himself known. He is only revealed through the spirit of the sons of God that are born of His Spirit. An institution, an organization, a business agenda to grow a, a ministry and to make our name big and to be bigger and better than other institutions, to have boards and directors ruling over the affairs of those who are part of that institution. God will not be represented by that. And God is dismantling that. He is, he is undoing that notion. Right now, as we discussed this last weekend, Lungi said, as the world sees Christians, it judges all Christians under that which they perceive what is happening through the institutions and the activity and the behavior of the institutions that they see around them. God is changing that. And he's raising up in the earth the mountain of the house of the Lord. These are the sons of God. Only through the spirit that is born out of God, through the sons of God, will God allow his person to be represented. 
God is, His person is not presented in an institution or an organization. He is spirit. And it is spirit to spirit. Those who are born of the spirit of God. And so to understand that God is spirit, we must also understand that God is not three persons. There's this very common expression of God in three persons. That is not in scripture. God is never described as three persons. God is one. The Lord your God is one God. He is one spirit. Now the spirit of God, who God is as spirit, displays himself in a relationship of father and son. So there we see these three aspects. God is spirit. One spirit. Not different spirits. There's not a spirit of the father, a spirit of the son, and then this other force called the Holy Spirit. No, God is spirit, one spirit. The spirit of God displays himself for his purposes in the earth, for his purposes in creation, for his intent to make himself known in creation. He depicts himself in the relationship, father and son. The son submits to the will of the father. The son subjects to the father. The son receives authority from the father and is then given all authority. This is because of the intent and purpose for which God plans from heaven to earth to come in creation in the sons of God, which is you and I, those who are born of the spirit. And for that reason, God depicts this relationship of father and son. It is so that we can be assembled into the spirit of Christ, into son, and reconciled to the father, that we are then united again in the spirit, in the one spirit. Let's read a few passages of scripture and we'll just look at this briefly. John 14 verse 11, Jesus speaks and he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So which is it? Was Jesus in the Father or was the Father in Jesus? Yes, because there is one Spirit. The Father and the Son are both the Spirit of God. The same happens with you and I as we are born of the Spirit and Christ. Is Christ in you or are you found in Christ? Yes. So Galatians 2.20 speaks of, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. But Ephesians 4 uh, verse 15 speaks of us growing up into Christ himself, who is the head. So we are assembled into Christ. We are the body of Christ, assembled into Christ, but Christ is also in us. How can that be? One spirit. There is only one spirit. In fact, 1 Corinthians goes on to explain that we are baptized into the spirit. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 12 says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Further on in that passage, it also speaks of the gifts that were given, the gifts of the spirit. And it says, by that same spirit, this gift was given. And by the same spirit, this gift was given. All one spirit, the spirit of God. And the reason that scripture says God is the
the father of our spirits. Hebrews 12 verse 9. Shall we not much more submit to the father of our spirits and live? Let me just on a little sidebar here. Just explain why we refer to the terms sons of God. And we do not speak of being daughters of God. We are not born from God according to the flesh. God is not the father of our flesh. So God doesn't have a physical body. The relationship in God is father and son. That's not a gender issue. It is the relationship father and son by the spirit of God. So when we are assembled in Christ, we are assembled in son. It's not a gender thing. It's the relationship to the father. So our identity in Christ, being assembled in Christ, makes us sons of God. Because God is not the God of our flesh. There are no daughters and sons. It's not a gender thing. This is a spirit identity. And so we refer to us being the sons of God. It's a whole different thing when we speak of how we assign gender to put on display Christ in the church, male and female, husbands and wives and all of that. That's a different issue. That is for the purpose of depicting Christ in the church. But the relationship to God is not according to our flesh. So it's not sons and daughters who are the sons of God. Just on a side, because God is the father of our spirits. John 6 verse 63 speaks of the word and the words being spirit and life. Now Christ is the word become, Jesus was the word become flesh. It says in John 6, 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh doesn't profit anything. Jesus then says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. So in all of this understanding, it is, our daily mandate to put God on display. How God chooses to appear through us must become our daily mandate. And we can only participate in this mandate. We can only partake in the purposes of God and the intent of God to, made, to be made known through us when we participate by the Spirit. Our flesh, our works cannot get this done, cannot accomplish God's purpose. It is only by the Spirit. Now, each of us are uniquely different. Not one individual contains the wholeness or the fullness of God. So the Spirit of God is accurately depicted in each one of us, but not the fullness it takes the corporate body of Christ to put on display the fullness of the Spirit of God. It's much like if a scientist was to study ocean, the ocean water, you can go and take a bucket out of the ocean and you can study that sample of ocean water and all the attributes of the ocean the characteristics of the ocean water will accurately be found in that sample. But no one with a bucket of ocean water can imagine what the ocean is like. The ocean is far more than what can be contained in a bucket of ocean water. So similarly, each of our lives is a sample, an accurate sample of the Spirit of God when we are born of His Spirit and come to maturity as sons of God who live by the Spirit. But He uniquely displays Himself through each one in a different way 
each one uniquely putting something on display of who God is, but only in the corporate, the full expression will be seen. All those who are sons of God assembled into Christ as a fully mature corporate son. So our individual spirits are like sample bits, but when the whole comes together assembled into Christ, the fullness is seen. And that's what God is raising up and preparing to put on display in the earth. It is through this corporate body that he will accurately rule and reign in the earth. So to understand how we are to function as spirit, born of the spirit of God, then we have to understand the sevenfold spirit of God or the seven aspects or characteristics of who God is as spirit so that we can become like him and function effortlessly and smoothly in that which we were born again of the spirit to grow into to maturity. So we'll just look at this briefly and do a brief overview, um, setting ourselves up to go further in coming weeks and look more intently at this study on the seven spirits of God. So the seven spirits of God is depicted or are depicted. I could say both because it's sevenfold of one spirit. So it's is depicted of God in various ways. Now, in Revelations 4 verse 5, it is displayed as the seven lamps. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne burned seven lamps or seven torches of fire. These are the seven spirits of God. So we find before the throne, as we spoke in previous weeks, all these images. The 24 elders representing the authority of God through the sons of God in heaven that must come to earth. All authority in heaven and earth being given. But we also see the seven spirits of God depicted as the lamp, seven lamps. The next chapter, Revelations 5 verse 6, it says, I saw a lamb who appeared to have been slain. If we just look at this one passage of scripture, we'll we'll take a long time to, to work through each of this because... We can't, with our mind's eye, try and picture this because it doesn't make sense. You can't have a clear picture of a lamb that is, appears to have been slain, but it's standing, right? Standing in the center of the throne. So a lamb that is slain is not standing, but it appears to have been slain. That's a picture of who Christ is uh, as the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. But he's standing at the center of the throne. But he's encircled by the four living creatures, which we know represents the corporate son and the 24 elders, which also represents us as the body of Christ in a different way the extension of the authority of God 12 being divine authority divine rule times 2 in heaven and on earth then it goes on to say the lamb this this is the lamb that appears to have been slain but why I say we can't picture it with our human eye or imagination because What lamb has seven horns and what lamb has seven eyes? It won't look anything like a lamb anymore in our natural imagination, in how we picture a lamb. If it's got horns, it doesn't look like a lamb. We'll say it's a goat 
or something else. But it's seven horns. It looks like a monster. Seven eyes. It's an alien. So these things are not for us to try and picture and draw a picture. Oh, this is what the lamb looked like. A lamb that appears to have been slain, but it's standing. It's got seven horns. It's got seven eyes. Let's try and paint that. What would that look like? That's not what God is doing. He's giving us insight into the characteristics of the Spirit of Christ, of who Christ is. A lamb that is slain. Seven horns. Speaking of divine authority. The anointing that was on Jesus was the sevenfold Spirit of God by which He operated in the earth. The seven eyes speaking of divine vision, of insight, of discernment. Seeing from eternal perspective, perfectly aligned with how God sees it by the Spirit accurately. Seeing and discerning everything. Now it says the seven horns and the seven eyes represent the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So, horns and eyes are not the Spirit of God. They represent, they represent the seven spirits of God. So, speaking of the characteristics, horns, speaking of authority, speaking of rule, speaking of majesty, anointed authority, eyes, speaking of discernment, insight, understanding, all-knowing God. The all-knowing God who sees everything, who knows everything. Depicted, yeah, the seven spirits of God. Let's just go on and, and look how in the Old Testament already God has prepared by shadow and type us to come into the understanding of this. Zechariah 3 verse 7 to 10. This is what the Lord of hosts says. If you walk in my ways and keep my instructions, then you will govern my house and will also have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among those who are standing here. Here now, O high priest Joshua, you and your companion seated before you, who are indeed a sign. For behold, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set before Joshua. On that one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave on it an inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in a single day. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, you will each invite your neighbor to sit under your own vine and fig tree. Okay, this is, this is too much to discuss in detail. So we're just going to touch on it just see a few things here as God is setting us up to understand through shadow and type remember scripture interprets scripture we see here that God says um, that if you walk in his ways and keep his instructions in other words you are righteous you will rule God is speaking of righteous rule here. You will govern my house. You will stand in a position of governance as if I am governing it myself. You are my viceroys. You are those magistrates of God who are to rule and govern my house. You will also have charge of my courts. And that's where we see the majesty, the magistrates of God. And I will give you a place amongst those who are standing here. And now it speaks of inclusion. You and your companions seated before you who are indeed a sign. A sign for who? It's the corporate son of God. 
It's this corporate man that you're assigned for. There's an inclusion. There is a corporiety. Many individuals joined as one whole. But it's for a sign. It's for a sign of what God will raise up in the fullness of time through his corporate son. How is that going to happen? He says, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. The branch speaks of Christ. Jesus himself says, I am the branch, you are the vines, if you abide in me. He is the branch, and we'll see this branch in other passages of scripture in a moment, and what that refers to. The seven spirits of God are depicted as a lamp. It's also depicted here, and you'll see why it's depicted as the branch and as a stone. The stone I have set before Joshua. One stone are seven eyes. You tie in that which is now revealed in Revelation. The seven eyes. A depiction of the seven spirits of God. The branch is the stump that comes out out of the shoot. The shoot that comes out out of the stump of Jesse. The branch. And we'll see that in a moment. Isaiah 11 verse 1 and 2. A shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will appear. The connection to Jesse, of course, is the humanity through which God chooses to display his spirit. The stump of Jesse is Jesse, of course, the father of David. David being a picture of a king and a priest. The royal priesthood. Those who are the sons of God, born of human flesh, of Jesse in David's case, but through whom God says, I will put my spirit and I will reveal myself. And from the branch who is Christ, of course, we are rooted into the branch. We are engraved. We are joined and tied into Christ, who is the branch. That will bear fruit. It goes on verse 2 and it says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, that branch. Here we see the branch, the Spirit of the Lord resting on him, the sevenfold Spirit of God. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The sevenfold spirit or the seven characteristics of the spirit of God depicted as the branch. The results of this is seen in verse 3 and 4. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see and he will not decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and with equity he will decide for the lowly of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Here we see the result is righteous rule. Not judging by the flesh, not judging by human wisdom, what the eyes see and the ears hear, but righteous rule. Righteous rule. This becomes, as I said, the focal aspect or characteristic of the Spirit of God. It's about righteous rule. The Lordship of God and the Spirit of God in the sevenfold spirit, the center 
pillar of this, the, the center focus of this, is really depicted in the menorah. If you see the, the lampstand that God instructed in Ezekiel 25 to construct. They had to construct it out of one solid piece of gold. Not different pieces. One piece of gold. But it had a central piece. And out of the central piece, there were six arms coming up. Altogether, seven. If you look at the picture of the menorah, and we'll put it up on the video now, it's got the central piece. And you can go and read uh, Exodus 25 where God instructed how to make this as a shadow and a type. And we see the six arms coming out, forming seven. The spirit of lordship, the spirit of the Lord is the central theme. The central focus. Out of lordship, the Lord your God is one God, one spirit. The central focus is He is Lord. Lord of all. His rule, His dominion will be forever and ever. His righteous rule and of the kingdom of God and of His rule there will be no end. It is the central focus of the rule of God. The spirit of lordship that that we see out of all of this, the other aspects of who God is flows, as depicted in this candle stick or this lamp stand of Exodus 25, which we find again in Revelations. Now, next week, we will look at, if we get to it already, next week we'll look at the spirit of lordship and see how this is the central focus. It's got to do with ruling, as we see in Zechariah 3. Governing the house of God. Having charge over his courts. But ruling has got to do with putting on display the essence of who God is. God is love. And we're going to see how the two are knit together. It's the same expression to put on display the lordship of the spirit of God, the rule of God, it must be done through love. Love puts on display the rule of God and they work hand in hand. It is through love that there is rule. Even in our lives when we operate in the spirit of lordship, when we're ruling, we're ruling on behalf of those that God has entrusted to us. It is love. It's not overlording. And that's how the enemy has twisted this. There's been images of lordship or ruling that leaves a bitter taste. And it's got ugly connotations because it's separated from the love of God. And so it is abusive. And it is for selfish gain. And it is at the expense of others. It is dominating. Where the dominion of God, the rule of God, is based in love. And it is for the benefit of the subjects of your rule. And we'll see how love and lordship is foundational to all the outflow of how we put God on display. The characteristics of God put on display through the body of Christ. By this, they will know that you are my disciples. By your love, one for another. Do not say you know God, but there's no love. You can have all the gifts, but if love is not put on display, you don't even know God. You're not operating by the Spirit of God. So as God is teaching us to operate in the Spirit of Lordship, He's also teaching us
that it is putting on display the essence of God is love. And as God's preparing us, we are being fashioned and formed because we have been designed to finish the work that Jesus initiated on the earth. To be the exact representation of the love of God on the earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven through us, the sons of God born of the Spirit of God. We look forward to studying this further in the months to come, but allow God to do the work in your heart, to transform you into His likeness, not to have head knowledge about a subject matter, but to become the radiance of the Father's glory. God bless you. Grace and peace. Bye.